So what is event sourcing anyways? I'm gonna try to explain it in a very easy way so that it's easy to grasp for everyone who haven't worked with it. We're also gonna go over the code and I already prepared some diagrams. So for visual learners, that's gonna be much, much easier to understand. That's an interesting concept. It's one of those design patterns or architectural patterns within the event driven world. So let's imagine we're a banking system and instead of showing that a user has 50 bucks on their balance because some actions happen and we don't really know what exactly happened here. We make sure that every time there's an event, let's say the user got some money, user spent some money, we actually track how much they spent. Let's say they spent 20 bucks or they added 50 bucks from someone else. And these events are immutable, meaning no one can go and change these events. And this is how event sourcing is pretty much gonna work. Now, why is it good and what are the best use cases and when to use it? As you can already understand, it's perfect for auditing, compliance and traceability. So companies like banking companies or ticketing companies or insurance companies, basically they need to keep the track of all the changes because if a customer comes and says, hey, I'm not sure if I added 50 bucks here or I got 60 bucks, can you prove me that? You actually need to go back in the history and be able to come to the specific event and then be able to replay it from there onwards to be able to prove that. So basically compliance, whenever you deal with the government or with a lot of money and traceability, when you need to be able to trace all the events back, event sourcing is great for it. Now replayability, when you need to prove something and go back in time and then go back in the future again, or debugging and fraud detection, this is perfect. Also high write volume. So event sourcing is not only good for compliance topics, but it's also good for performance. And we're gonna talk about this. Why is it good? Because you can combine it with CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It's also another design pattern. And I have a video on this, go check it out. Basically, we're trying to separate the read databases from a write database so that it's not only one database that serves the data. The user requests go to do two different databases because as we know, the reads are happening much more often than the writes and we don't want to block our writes whenever a read is happening. Now, let's go over to Ice Panel and Ice Panel is one of those great tools that I really admire. It's a modeling and diagramming tool especially for complex architectures that can let you use reusable objects within different diagrams. And it's much easier to keep track of everything instead of just documenting your API or your architecture within a random document page, right? And this is pretty much how it's gonna look like. I already created a lot of actors and systems and apps. And basically what an event sourced system would look like is where a client is sending a request to the gateway. And actually I can use one of those features called flows. And if I play the flow, we're gonna see everything one by one as a user journey. So the client basically sends a request to the gateway. Gateway takes care of the authentication and routing. I just put it here for clarity. And we have this guy called Handler API. Handler API is the entry point. You can pretty much call it whatever you want, but it's gonna handle the commands and queries. Commands is basically the write operation and the query is the read operation so that you know. So we're gonna take a look at the write operation because it's usually more complex. So within the write operation, we're first going to contact a Redis database for a snapshot. Why are we contacting the Redis database? Because the event store database and event store is actually one of those databases that's particularly made for event sourcing, but you can also use just a normal database, right? And store them as rows. Event store is where our immutable objects are going to be stored. Now, whenever you're making a write to the event store, you went to, you also want to fetch the data first, then compare it and then write it to the event store as a new event. For example, let's say the handler API wants to write a new object to the event store that a user has received 50 bucks. But our logic says that if the user has received less than 50 bucks, don't write it or don't allow this. 
This is why we need the latest snapshot of the database. And the snapshot, the latest snapshots of the database is for each account, specifically, this is how we're going to divide them by account IDs, is going to be stored within the Redis database. Then we read it from the Redis database. We also read it uh, from the event store. And then we basically rebuild the final state and publish it to the event store. We're going to take a look at the code so that it's easier to understand. Now, you might ask, why are we having an extra database here? Yeah, this is one of the flows of event source system. You actually have to have a lot of uh, storage. So after it's published to the event store, we can asynchronously, and by the way, these purple lines mean they're asynchronous. I added a tag for synchronous and asynchronous requests. Also, we have a technology choice. You will see that Raptum queue is used for these calls. And it's usually recommended to use Raptum queue with event sourcing to, for example, handle back pressure. And I have a video on this. But anyway, the one of the, oh, I made a typo. It's not a listener, listener. It's a listener service and I called it two because we have another listener service. And this listener service is simply going to deal with third party uh, services like mailing service. We also have another listener service. And this listener service is updating our materialized views. So what are the materialized views? Basically the databases from which the read requests are going to be happening. So the read request is also handled by the handler API. And the read request is basically going to go like this. So going back, we're going to update our two databases. So the relational database and the document database. This is the cool thing about such uh, event driven architectures and uh, event sourcing is that it automatically segregates the commands from queries. So when you want to query, you have a choice of different databases. And these are materialized views, meaning these are pretty much pre computed uh, queries or pre-built queries. There's a thing called materialized views within databases. But when we talk about event sourcing, materialized views are not the database materialized views. We're simply referring to the fact that we have different databases to fetch the data from. So basically, the data that's within the event store, the data that's within the snapshot DB, and the data that's within these two databases is pretty much duplicated. Yeah, you heard me right. But within the event store, it's stored as immutable objects, a series of immutable objects. Here we store always the final state of a particular request. And the relational or documented database has the same thing as the event store, but it's optimized for the read queries. You get that? So document database is updated. And finally, the handler API can read the data from these materialized views. Now, the cool thing here is that we have immediate consistency and eventual consistency. So these two terms are coming from asynchronous or event driven development. And the second mean the, the latter one means that eventual consistency does not ensure that whenever the handler API reads the data, the updated data that it updated a second ago, whenever it reads the data from the relation database, the system is going to be so fast that it already manages to propagate the changes here. This is what we mean by eventual consistency. On the other hand, immediate consistency means that whenever the snapshot database is updated, every time you read the data from it, you're all, always going to get the latest data. So these two guys, the event store and snapshot DB, they have an immediate consistency. You update it, you read it, you get the latest data. But since the data is flowing from here to this listener service, and then this listener service has to take care of the updating these two databases, by the time the handler API reads it, there might be some delay. Now, I'm going to go to the code and try to explain how this pretty much would work in practice. So we have a wrapped MQ. And we have this endpoint, the only endpoint that we have, and where it's a command endpoint, and we want to do some kind of a command. So we're sending the account ID of a user and some body for a transaction. So this handle command is basically what this handler API uh, would do. So we're going to get aggregate state. And what's an aggregate? 
Actually, this is one of the terms that we could avoid, but I did not. An aggregate is coming from DDD, domain-driven design. I also have a video on this, so go check it out. But it basically is a pattern in DDD, and it's a cluster of domain objects that can be treated as a single unit. In our case, we can say that our account is an aggregate, right? So we pass the account ID. And what we want to do, looking at our diagram here, we want to fetch the latest data for this specific account from our snapshot DB. And since it's Redis, it's going to be very, very fast, right? This is what we want. So let's go inside this method. And we're going to see that we're getting the cache. If there is a cache, we simply return the cache. And most of the cases, it's going to be this. If there's no cache, then we try to get the latest snapshot and we try to update the state. Also, we need to read the stream from the event store. So if I go inside this read stream, we're going to see that we're using the event store and we're basically reading the data from the event store. And after the event store or the data is read from there, we're also going to update the balance. So as you can see, we're reading from two different sources here and updating our state in memory. And then we can save it in the cache in, in Redis again. And we also can also do snapshots so that whenever a new request is coming here, we can already quit here and return the cache. All right. So let's say we have the build state and we're going to check if the command time is withdraw and if the balance is less than withdraw because we cannot yeah, withdraw more money than we have then we throw an error. Otherwise, we're going to call this append event and append event. First of all, it's going to save the data to the event store. So we're going to save the data here after the uh, after the object is ready to be saved. And at the same time, we're going to send it to the RabbitMQ channel or RabbitMQ queue. And this, these are basically the lines. This one, this one are the RabbitMQ queues. Uh, that have listeners attached to them. Now, going back, we're simply going to return the state and the pending state. All right. Now, the last thing to discuss is actually the drawbacks of event sourcing pattern. So let's go to our blackboard and I listed some of the drawbacks that we need to be really aware of. So as I said, number zero is eventual consistency. So there can be some kind of a delay within your system. So if you're a stock market and you need a precision, a very high precision, maybe event sourcing might not be good for a particular case. Also increased complexity. Uh, this article from Microsoft has a really good sentence. Event sourcing is a complex pattern that permeates, permeates uh, through the entire architecture and introduces trade-offs to achieve increased performance, scalability, and audibility. Once your system becomes an event sourcing system, all future, all future designs decisions are constrained by the fact that this is an event sourcing system. Basically, it's very hard to go back and forth if you make your system an event source system. So keep this in mind. It's a very big decision to make and you got to probably make it with a lot of people within your team to come to a consensus. Also event versioning. So let's say if the object that you're saving here as an event has a different structure now, how do you do it? How can you do versioning? Well, there are multiple ways, but the, the best way is to simply change the way these listeners are or the and, and the handler API is going to handle this new structure of the object. Now it's additional code because you have to have two if statements, if version or if object type one do this, if object type two do this. Um, but the problem is you cannot simply go and uh, back in history and modify all the events structures because we said that these events are immutable. So there's some uh, drawbacks. You need to be very careful with the object structure. Also maintenance. As if so, we have a lot of data here we have a lot of components. So you have to maintain all these databases that you might have, at least the event store, obviously. Also, you need to maintain the snapshot database if you want to be fast. And these are basically depending on your choice, what kind of databases or materialized views you want to have. Still a lot of maintenance, I would say. And maintenance 
of materialized views and snapshots as I said here. So I hope you guys liked the video. Go check out our sponsor Ice Panel. I really like using this tool and it's been quite fun so far. If you liked the video, also don't forget to subscribe, smash like and write me any comments that you have in case you have any questions and I'm going to try to answer them as soon as possible. I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.